So good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Jen Santos uh, with the City of Santa Rosa Parks. And we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm wondering if we can go ahead and move to the next slide while we get started. And um, just wanted to thank you all for attending tonight. I know everyone's uh, got very busy schedules, so I really appreciate um, your attendance tonight. And um, I wanted to take this time to um, just welcome you overall. And um, we are here tonight to talk about the master plan for Dutch Floor Park. This is the third in a series of three planned neighborhood meetings where all previous feedback has been received, ha received has been used to create the new draft, draft master plan you're gonna see tonight. We'll also to continue to receive feedback tonight from you. And for those of you that have friends or relatives, neighbors that weren't able to attend tonight, we'll also have an online survey available at the Parks, uh, Rec and Parks website um, if you weren't able to attend tonight. Um, and then before we get started, I also wanted to take a moment to introduce a few folks um, that are attending the meeting tonight. Uh, from what I could tell so far, sometimes it's hard to tell. So if I've missed somebody, I apologize, but I wanted to let you know we have uh, Carol Quant, our Board of Community Services Chair, as well as Terry Griffin, our Vice Chair for the Board of Community Services, and Board of Community Services members, uh, Madonna Feather and Cynthia Rich. And if I miss somebody, I'm sorry. Um, that's who I could see so far. I also would like to introduce Tim Bernard and Emily Ander. Uh, you'll see their names up on the screen. They are helping behind the scenes, hosting the meeting tonight, and they're gonna coordinate all the comments and questions tonight, assist during the meeting and take notes, of course. Um, I'd also like to introduce Haley Watterson from Plural Landscapes Architecture Studio, uh, who is our consultant assisting with the master planning process. And um, I don't know, if Haley, if you have any introductions to make. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, I'm Haley, and I'm here with uh, Mariam Arias with our team as well. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Okay, so before we get started, I have a few um, housekeeping things to go over. So panelists and presenters, please silence your cell phones and keep microphones muted if not speaking. Members of the public joining this meeting will have webcams and microphones muted. If you're joining, the meeting and you choose to speak during the public comments portion of the agenda for privacy concerns, the host will rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your cell phone number. Additionally, the city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption and will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. So now I'm going to turn it over to our host, uh, Tim Bernard, to explain um, how to participate uh, with public comments and polling that will be conducted at um, tonight's meeting. Tim? Thanks, Jen. There will be an opportunity near the end of the presentation for questions and comments. The host will lower all hands until the public comment item is open. The facilitator will open the floor for questions and answers. Once the facilitator has called for public comment, the facilitator will ask the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on you if you have raised your hand. The host will unmute your microphone for your comment and then will mute you once you are finished speaking. A courtesy timer will appear while you are asking your question or making a comment. The facilitator, host, or co-host will respond to each question or comment as it is raised. You will need to raise your hand again if a follow-up question is generated based on the response you receive. There is also the opportunity to ask questions throughout the presentation by clicking the Q&A feature in your Zoom menu or toolbar and typing in your question. The host will keep an eye on these questions and will answer them in writing as time allows or will ask the presenters to answer them in intervals throughout the presentation. Any questions not answered during the presentation will be addressed during the question and public comment portion of the presentation. Additionally, there will be four opportunities for participate, to participate in poll, polls throughout the presentation. 
all questions are single or multiple choice. You must answer all questions in order to submit your response. The submit button is at the very bottom of each poll. You may need to scroll to the bottom of your screen to find it. If you are completing the poll on your smartphone, you must answer the first question before you may answer the que second question, etc. If the participating, if you are participating in the meeting via landline, you will need not be able to participate in the poll at this time. However, the poll will be available via the city website until September 9th following the meeting. Please check srcity.org forward slash 248 forward slash parks dash projects to complete the survey. Once everyone has completed the poll and it has been closed, the results will appear immediately and the facilitator will walk you through the results. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so we're going to get started and um, I'm going to turn it over to our landscape architects and uh, turn it over to Haley from Plural uh, Landscape Architecture Studio to get us started and roll us through. And uh, before we do, I just wanted to let you know that um, we do have a Q&A period and uh, we have plenty of time for repeat questions as well if you have uh, questions after that. So Haley, go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to talk about um, Dutch Floor Neighborhood Park. We'll be going through the presentation. Um, and we'll start with looking at the schedule um, and then we'll look at the community meeting number two and the online results that resulted from that community meeting. Um, we'll share those with you all. And then we'll spend some time, uh, the most of the presentation going through the draft uh, master plan. So we've taken if you recall in community meeting number two, we had three master plan options and three neighborhood, uh, three playground options. And we received comments and feedback on those options. And tonight we're presenting a combination, um, narrowing those options down to one plan. Uh, so we'll share those with you. Um, and they're very much informed by the, by the uh, comments we received. And through the presentation, there'll be some moments where we stop and ask a few questions. That'll uh, be the Zoom polls that Tim was mentioning. Um, and again, there'll be open comment um, at the end of the presentation. And please use that Q&A. Tim will monitor it, monitor it for us and um, would love to get as much feedback and, and comment as we can. So we're talking about uh, Dutch Floor Neighborhood Park. Um, the city is divided into these four quadrants separated by the, the 101 and the 12 uh, freeways. And uh, Dutch Floor Neighborhood Park is within the Northwest quadrant, number one here on the screen, located uh, where that, approximately where that red star is. And the goals of this project um, are really focused around creating um, a safe and welcoming park and playground. Um, we're starting looking at a master plan for the park, which is an overarching plan uh, for the entire park, um, which could be implemented all at once or, or, or over time, and then specifically looking um, at the playground um, improvements, wanting to improve the connectivity between the two existing playgrounds, um, increase uh, accessibility and usability of the park. Um, it's uh, an, an aging park that will um, require some upgrades to the paths and to the some of the infrastructure. Um, and an important goal for us too is to enhance the park's beauty. Um, it is a, an existing park, has beautiful mature trees and we wanna build on um, that beauty. So we'll be looking um, to take the two existing playgrounds and create more connectivity between them, um, moving them closer together because currently they're spread, uh, spread apart quite a bit, which makes families with, with kids in different age, grade, age groups, um, makes it a little challenging to observe them. So we can make that a little bit easier by moving them closer together. Uh, there's some existing adult fitness equipment uh, within the park. So we'll be looking at uh, upgrading that equipment. Um, and again, just updating the overall park infrastructure, which includes drainage, irrigation, furniture, um, and some of the planting. So where, where are we in this whole 
process, this long process, we're in this first uh, phase, which we're calling the master plan and community engagement. Uh, we've done two community meetings. The last one was in May, and um, this is the last community meeting before we will, after that, we will go to the Board of Community Services and the City Council. Um, following um, those approvals, we would move on to the construction sets uh, starting starting the end of this year, moving into next year. Um, and if all goes well, that would be looking at a construction time somewhere spring um, of 2022. And as you all know, schedules are always in draft form. So this is as much as we know right now. So we'll start with going through the results of the, uh, the community meeting number two. So we had two sets of, um, of data that came from uh, these two different feedback formats. One was the community meeting, which was on um, the 27th of May. And uh, we had around 17 respondents responding to the poll. There may have been a few more um, at, the, at the meeting. And then we had an online survey up following that meeting that was up for about three weeks. And we had 59 respondents from that um, online survey. So we'll look at the survey results together um, and you'll see uh, throughout the survey on the left, we'll show you the results from the community meeting that was this Zoom meeting uh, in May. And then on the right, you'll see the results from the online survey. And then the following slide um, in this series will be um, a combination of both of this data into one to get the kind of full picture of what we've heard. And we, we really, it's really important to us to, to um, make sure we're engaging with uh, the community surrounding the park, given that this is um, a neighborhood uh, park. And happy to report that that, um, that seems to be who we're, we're chatting with, um, the community meeting results um, and the online survey are um, primarily um, residents within the Northwest Quadrant. And the combined results, um, the 72% of respondents coming from um, our Northwest West Quadrant. We also wanted to know how frequent um, people visit the park, again, to try to gauge, um, are we talking to um, the kind of day-to-day -day weekly park users? Um, again, this kind of aligns with the previous data that we saw um, where we're mostly um, getting respondents from users that are there daily, which is amazing, um, and, and weekly. And again, the combined results um, with over 60% of the respondents um, using the park daily um, or weekly. Then we also like to ask how, um, how people heard about this meeting to help us kind of refine the way that we, we outreach to communities. Um, and through the community meeting uh, that we had, we had a lot of attendance from, um, that heard about the meeting from the elementary school, which was really great. Um, we have been talking with the elementary school uh, throughout this process. Um, you may remember if you were at the first community meeting, uh, we, and the second one, we, we showed some, um, projects that we did with the school. So there was a school-wide outreach uh, project where the students um, did sketches and drawings and, and writings within their classes um, about, about the playground. There are kind of visions and ideas for the playground. And we've collected that data um, and have folded that into some of our playground um, inspirations. And then the online survey results primarily coming from um, city connection and, and social media. Those kind of our, our, our primary sources of outreach. We also wanted to learn a little bit how how long, uh, how far away people are from the park. Um, and again, this aligns with people being in Northwest West Quadrant. Um, but more specifically, it really tells us that um, a lot of the people who have been responding are within a five to 10 walk, minute walking distance. So they're blocks away from the park, um, which is really great. And looking at the combined survey results here with half of 
our respondents walking uh, to the park. Now we'll jump into um, the park, uh, the master plan and the playground options that we shared. And, and I'll pull them up again um, to remind you all what these options were, because A, B, and C can get um, lost. So we'll look at that here in, in, in the next slides. Um, so we had three options uh, for the master plan. In the community meeting, um, option C was preferred by 50% with option B following um, behind at 39. Um, the online survey results had a slight preference for option B uh, with option C trailing um, close behind. Which put the combined results um, favoring option C um, at 45%. Uh, with option B trailing um, close behind. And to refresh everyone's memory, these are, are what the three master plan options look like at the last meeting. Um, option C was the, um, the one with the highest amount of votes. Um, and we kind of pulled out what the main characteristics of option C are and how they different, uh, differentiate themselves itself from option A and option B. So option C has a smaller, um, kind of more focused stormwater garden at the entry, at the corner of Whitechapel and Exeter, um, with a path and a place to sit within the garden, which is a little bit different from the other two options. There are more adult fitness stations. So in the other two options, we, we had uh, four um, stations adjacent to the playground. And in option C, we had those four and we had additional ones um, along the path here off of Whitechapel. And in option C, we were showing um, more trees and more shade. Um, and there was no group picnic um, space in option C. So those are kind of the main um, elements of option C that differentiated it from A and B. The next question that we asked was which playground option uh, people preferred. And these results were pretty close. Uh, we had a scheme called Dry Creek, one called Loops, and one called the Enchanted Forest. And again, I'll show you these um, in the next couple of slides. Um, and in both the community meeting and the online survey results, the Dry Creek was slightly ahead of, of the other two. And in the combined results that put the Dry Creek um, at 37%, and uh, the Enchanted Forest and Luge trailing close behind that. And so these, what, these are what the options, um, a summary of what those options were. Um, option A, uh, calling the Dry Creek, which is inspired by kind of a, a nature, natural materials, um, inspired by this kind of creek concept. Um, B was loops, and that was a more kind of artful, sculptural play um, forward option. And then the last one was the Enchanted Forest, which was a bit more whimsical, had um, many trees in the playground and lots of um, um, kind of whimsical play elements. And so since the, the voting was all really close between these two, um, we did start with the Dry Creek concept as the sort of base, but we, we pulled in some of the other um, features from Loops and Enchanted Forest to try to pull, pull some of these um, ideas together. Um, to more of a hybrid scheme. We wanted to also um, mention some of the responses we got from, um, there was a couple of open format um, opportunities to provide comments. Um, and then also some things we heard verbally in the, in the last community meeting. So some of those things, um, and these are the most common topics that we received. So there was, um, a desire for uh, a more defined edge between the elementary school and the park. Um, there was a concern about large picnic areas, a request for no large picnic areas or barbecue areas. Um, and then a couple of comments around trying to leave the park um, in a natural feel um, using, the, using native plantings and things like that. Um, there's a number of concerns around suspicious activity at the, in the park. Um, and we're gonna address that in a couple of slides, um, we know about maybe a week or two after community meeting number two, that there was um, a shooting that had happened in the park. So we will address that. And then a couple of 
several comments about um, a desire to have sand in the playground. Um, additionally, we, we heard about more shade, um, some comments about wanting restrooms, some comments about no restrooms. There was a comment about um, the traffic and speed along Exeter with vehicles and um, a suggestion around speed bumps. Um, and we will be directing that comment to um, right departments within the city um, to take a look, closer look at that. Uh, there was a request for games like cornhole and chess to be located in the park, uh, which we've taken a look at. Um, and then there was some comments about a dog park and disc golf uh, that were made. And again, I think those um, were a little bit constrained uh, in terms of the, the size of the park that we have to accommodate those uses. Um, and I think, we, again, we've passed on this comment um, to be placed in the more regional scale, regional park scale locations. So tonight um, we'll be looking at the draft master plan. Um, and, to, and this is it here on the right. We're gonna go into it in more detail, but just to hit the high level um, items that are included in this revised master plan. So we've included that stormwater garden at the entry uh, with the path and a bench. We've um, included a fence with a gate that would be operated by the school um, along that edge between the park and the elementary school. Um, we've made sure to continue along the lines of this kind of natural feel with native plantings and trees, um, looked at ways to provide more shade within the park at large. We've incorporated games, cornhole, chess, and table tennis. Uh, we've included the additional fitness stations, so a total of seven. Um, we have provided um, seating options uh, within the park, so within the playground, but also outside of the playground. And then we've really been thinking about clear lines of sight and safety um, throughout the park. And speaking, on, speaking about safety, we wanted to just take a moment to um, talk about some of the concerns around the activities um, that had happened in the park recently. Um, and Jen and Tim, feel free to jump in here, um, but I wanted to just share that they've been in, in touch with the police department around the, the incident of the shooting um, and had passed along some things that we should be considering, um, things that we can do through this master planning process to help um, increase safety through the park. Um, and they did assure us that they feel that the incident was um, a targeted incident and that the safe is generally um, a safe place. Um, so they passed along these um, items for us. Uh, one of the things is to make sure we have clear lines of sight. So um, primarily police officers um, patrolling the adjacent streets. Um, so having the ability for them to kind of see in their patrol car, see up and through the park um, as they're around, moving around the perimeter of the park. So we'll be thinking about that. And then focusing the gathering spaces like the playground within those clear lines of sight, avoiding placing kind of program um, around any corners um, where the line of sight is um, a little bit constrained. Keeping, um, selecting low shrubs and maintaining them low for that line of sight, um, providing high branching trees and making sure the trees are pruned. Luckily, because we have this mature park and mature trees, a lot of um, the foliage of the park, of the, of the park trees is up high and above that line of sight. So we have that going for us. Um, they also recommended posting the park signage uh, very clearly um, around the park rules within the park. And then um, also, suggested that if any neighbors see um, any suspicious activity that they could report um, that suspicious activity to the non-emergency line and um, did request that um, you provide as much specificity that you can around those activities. So now we'll jump into the various parts of the, of the master plan. And we'll start here at the corner of uh, Whitechapel and Exeter, which is uh, the existing low point of the park. And it is one of the main kind of entries to the park. So we thought this would be a great place to place a stormwater garden um, at this entry. So it, 
it marks kind of a threshold into the park and also collects the rain water that lands in the park, collects it, filters it and cleans it before it's released back into the city's sewer system. And within that garden, um, it's a really neat sustainable feature and there's opportunities for uh, signage around that element as a kind of educational opportunity to, to learn about how that garden um, works. And within that garden, um, we envision the park monument sign. There's a, and this is a piece of, um, that we would love to get feedback on from you today in the meeting. Uh, the existing sign is right here. It is a uh, timber uh, and kind of wood plank sign that's painted brown with um, yellow paint for the, the park sign. Um, this is kind of original to the park um, and has some kind of charm to it. Um, and we wanted to know how people feel about this monument sign. Um, this is the kind of big main sign that announces the name of the park. Typically there's one of these in um, a, a park size like this. We could look at upgrading um, or replacing it with um, a newer monument sign. Here's an example of the new monument sign that was recently installed at Coffee Park. It is a, um, a steel sign that's laser cut um, with some concrete uh, pilasters um, adjacent to it. I think we'll pause here and, um, and put up a poll to see how uh, people feel about the existing monument sign um, versus uh, replacing it. And Haley, I'm going to ask our host uh, to remind folks how to participate in the polling. And um, I know it's a lot of information, but just in case we have people joining in, we're going to say this every time. Um, but we want to make sure you have the opportunity to participate um, virtually as this is going along. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Tim to uh, let everybody know how to participate electronically. Thank you. Sure, Tim. Um Four questions are single or multiple choice. You must answer all questions in order to submit your response. The submit button is at the very bottom of your of each poll. You must you must scroll to the bottom of the of your screen to find to find the, the submit button. Uh, if you complete the poll on your smartphone, you must answer the first question before you can answer the second question, etc. If you're participating in the meeting via a landline, you will not be able to participate in the poll at this time. However, you can go to the city website and fill out the survey there until September 9th. Once everyone has completed the poll and has been closed, the, the results will appear immediately and the facilitator will walk you through the results. So you should see the poll up on your screen now, if you're with us on a device. And we're asking, should the existing park monument sign be replaced? And you can answer yes, no, um, and if you have no preference, that's fine too. If you're still thinking through it, I'll just kind of remind everyone we're looking at um, the existing park monument sign, which is um, original to the park. It is a uh, timber and wood plank sign that's painted uh, brown with a uh, yellow lettering. You could keep it, um, maybe even spruce it up, um, new paint or make you know slight modifications to it, or you could replace it with something um, new and it might be similar to this coffee park uh, precedent image here on the bottom left. We are at 15 of 15 reporting so I'm going to close the poll. Thanks Emily.
and the results are in. All right, so we've got 60% um, of our participants saying, yes, um, it's time to replace the existing monument sign, 33% saying no, and then seven um, have no preference. Thank you all, and if you have any pieces of detail to add to your answer, we'd be happy to hear those at the open comment session. The next thing we wanted to highlight um, in the master plan is the addition of uh, shade canopies over the playground, which you'll see in more detail. We're gonna zoom into that playground um, after we get through the overall park plan. But we also um, are looking at adding more trees for um, the existing sidewalks that are there, um, particularly on Exeter. It's a quite a long stretch there without any shade. So uh, as you can see in that existing image there on the top left, so looking to um, add some trees to provide shade and comfort along that um, sidewalk. And again, along um, White Chapel as well. And we're also exploring adding um, some additional trees within the playground. There are a lot of existing um, mature trees as we've mentioned. Uh, so that's kind of a, a great thing that we, we would like to build on. Oh, we'd also like to highlight uh, some of the seating options within the park. Um, we're looking at benches uh, scattered um, across, uh, adjacent to the paths in the park and then picnic tables within the playground. So there's um, options for seating next to the playground or outside the playground. Um, if you aren't there enjoying the playground and you just wanna enjoy the park, there's options for you there too. I, I think someone meant made a comment like that um, in the second community meeting. So we wanted to um, highlight these options. And again, an, another seating opportunity in that uh, stormwater garden. We'll be um, including seven uh, adult fitness stations. And um, as we start to uh, narrow in on what that equipment is. This is another point where we'd love to get your feedback tonight. We've um, identified uh, seven uh, stations and we wanted to hear what kind of equipment um, people would prefer. Um, there's a lot of options for this equipment these days. There's um, items that are used for cardio, uh, like bikes or um, other kind of moving uh, cardio machines. And um, then there's strength training, strength training machines. Um, and then there's also a question around um, the ability level that we're providing for. So I think there's two Zoom questions that are polling questions that are gonna come up um, around this topic. All right, and uh, sorry to do this to y'all again, but Tim, can you just go ahead and read that again, just in case anybody new joined? Sure, Jen. <clears throat> um, poll questions are single or multiple choice. You must answer all questions in order to submit your response. The submit button is at the very end of the, each poll. You may need to scroll to the bottom of the screen to find it. If you are completing the poll on your smartphone, you must answer the first question before you can answer the second question, etc. If you are participating in the meeting via landline, you will not be able to participate in the poll at this time. However, you can uh, take the poll that's available online at um, srcity.org. Once everyone has completed the poll it, and it has been closed, the results will appear immediately and the facilitator will go through the results. Thanks, Tim. And yeah, go ahead and start, and start voting. And I just wanted to add simply that uh, I'll keep an eye on the attendees. Um, and if we don't have any new ones joined, then we, we can uh, skip that language. Okay. Thanks, Jen. And I think if anybody has any trouble too with, with the polling, they can raise their hand and, or put it in the chat and, and we will help you as best as we can. So the, so the two questions around the exercise equipment, uh, the first one is around what, what type of uh, adult exercise equipment should be included. Um, primarily cardio stations, primarily strength training stations, or a mix of both. Um, and then again, if you don't have a preference, 
And when we get to the open session um, period of this, um, for those of you who, who are really focused on, on this aspect, it would be great to, if you have feedback or specific equipment that you'd like to see, um, it'd be great to, to hear that. And then the second question is around the, um, the fitness level, the skill level uh, for these uh, equipment stations. Um, so the options there are whether it's multi-generational equipment, um, that's kind of like something for everybody, um, or is this a community that um, is looking for more challenging equipment, more challenging um, kind of fitness opportunities? Um, or is this a, a community that would like to uh, see equipment that's more focused around the kind of 65 plus community? Um, and then again, if you don't have a preference. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll because it's been at 12 of 15. I saw one more report, so I'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll now and show the results. For the first question, um, we have 8% looking for primarily cardio stations, 23% um, looking for primarily strength training stations, and then 54% looking for a mix, and then um, a handful who don't have a preference. Um, option, or sorry, question two around skill level, uh, primarily folks looking for uh, multi-generational equipment, which would have some of those high ability stations um, and then ones for um, in the 65 plus community. Thank you all. And again, um, sometimes people have really specific requests for certain kinds of equipment. Um, so if that's you, please talk to us um, during the open comment session. The next item of the master plan we wanted to um, highlight is the edge uh, along the Biola Elementary School. Uh, we've been uh, talking with the principal there um, and working, uh, working through some ideas about this edge. Um, the park uh, property line is this red dash line that you see here. Um, and so the improvements that we're looking at are within the, the school's property. Um, we have talked with them about including a, um, a low fence with a gate uh, that would provide access from the park. And that gate would be open um, before school and after school. And it would be the gate access would be operated by the school. Um, but the goal is to allow the um, drop offs and pickups that happen through the park to continue to, to happen. And we're thinking that fence is um, something you can see through. Um, it's low, it's really meant to provide a physical barrier, a psychological barrier um, for that edge of the school. And um, with that, there may be some, um, some new shrub planting, some new shade trees. Um, there could even be uh, some seating elements and benches tucked in there that face the existing um, sport courts of the elementary school. So that's the a summary of the, the main features of the overall master plan. Uh, we'll now dive into a closer look into the playground. Um, and again, just stopping here um, to remind ourselves kind of where we were last and, and, and uh, as we start to talk about where we are now. Starting from um, the concept of the dry creek, um, we use that as the framework uh, to develop the, the playground. But we pulled in some ideas uh, from the loops option that we liked, uh, like some of the, the running uh, paths that provide kind of an accessible path around the playground. Um, and then in the Chanted Forest, we brought in some of those elements, including a few more trees in the playground um, and some of the whimsical play elements that uh, people responded uh, well to. So I kind of pulled those all in together to this refined uh, playground. 
Um, and this first diagram is meant to just kind of orient you uh, to the site. There is, um, as we mentioned, currently the playground, the playgrounds at the park are um, have a five to 12 area and a two to five area that are separated um, by quite some ways. So as part of this project, we're pulling the playgrounds together um, and still providing a um, kind of physical separation within a concrete path, but they're right next to each other. So there's kind of uh, you know, lots of fluidity between the two spaces, but, but the age groups are defined um, and the five to 12 is here and the two to five um, is here. This is the enlarged plan of the playground. Um, and at this master plan phase, we really have the bones, the kind of framework of the playground, the general layout, and we have a sense of um, how much equipment and the types of equipment that we will be including. We haven't yet picked out the exact play equipment that happens at, a, at the next uh, phase of development of this plan. Um, so I wanted to just highlight um, a few things here, and then we're going to go into, into more detail again over each one of these items, but this is kind of an overview um, of the playground. So this is a, we're zooming in now. This is Exeter Drive here on the left. Um, these are four of the exercise stations that are adjacent to the playground. There's three primary entries into the playground. Uh, one, which is aligned with the path that leads you to Biola Elementary School. One um, from the Southern entrance and one from the Northwest side. Um, this path that wraps around this side, the kind of Northeast side of the playground um, is a couple of feet higher than the playground itself. And uh, in that we've, planning on providing this kind of boulder edge that uh, mitigates that grade change and also acts as um, a frame for the playground to provide kind of a clear boundary of, um, of play to help parents keep track of the kids and um, without having to provide any kind of physical barriers like a fence. Uh, so we'll, within that, we're tucking in um, some uh, sand and water play elements in both uh, age group playgrounds. Um, there are these three focused kind of gathering and seating areas. Uh, the two on either end are picnic tables. And then the one in the center is the games room uh, where we have the cornhole, chess and um, ping pong. And then they're divided by this path um, and the play equipment is uh, located within these rooms. And then this kind of bluish gray path that winds around the playground um, is a, a path that children can chase each other on, um, play tag, um, and it's part of this uh, dry creek feature. Um, and before we dive in, I just want to step back and talk a little bit about um, where this kind of dry creek um, inspiration came from. Santa Rosa is um, in the Santa Rosa Creek it's very important to, to the city and its development. Um, some of the first people that came to live here came here for this kind of really rich um, basin uh, that Santa, Santa Rosa um, sits within. And then the Santa Rosa Creek itself is just blocks from this playground. Um, so it seemed like a great place to kind of pull inspiration from um, and to kind of bring awareness to our kind of ecological setting. And so within that, we've interpreted that to be this frame that I, I mentioned uh, before. Um, and along, along this edge on the northeast side is that kind of boulder scree that kids can climb over. Um, and other playgrounds that have a similar feature, uh, people use it to kind of sit and gather um, and kind of you know, enjoy watching from, from that edge. Um, and kids can kind of climb around it as well. Um, and in the path that moves along the other side of the playground is tucked kind of within the existing trees. So we have this kind of dry creek side um, on the east and this more kind of shaded um, path to the creek side on the west. And within that, there are a few um, kind of focused sand play areas where um, the sand would be enclosed 
um, either through raised um, elements like this raised sand table, it could be depressed, um, but we're really looking to kind of contain um, the sand. And then within that, um, some potential water sources that uh, could allow kids to create mud and really start to build when, you, when you're able to get that sand to be a little bit wet. Um, and so they, those might be um, small hand pumps that release a small amount of water to, to mix with the sand. And those would be located right, right adjacent to those sand areas. So while, while those areas are sand, the majority of the surfacing of the playground is the fibar, fibar mulch um, surfacing. And then we wanted to um, just share a range of precedent images for the types of play equipment that we'll be looking to include. And based on our early studies, we have a sense of um, what we think we will have room for. Um, and uh, again, what we've heard from people are the most important. Um, so the, the post and platform structures um, that are part of those kind of traditional play elements uh, will be a big part of this playground. Uh, there'll be one in the five to 12 and one in the two to five area. Uh, we're looking at um, structures that um, feel more natural, whether they're in the kind of warm um, brown colors, um, maybe limited amounts of uh, robinia wood, and um, otherwise this kind of concrete formed wood uh, structures. We've heard a lot of interest um, and enthusiasm for a zip line, so we're really trying to make that happen. Um, requires a good amount of space, but um, we're committed to, to trying to make that happen. Um, swings, uh, of course, are really important. It's something we heard from the first community meeting. So we'll have swings for both age groups. Um, and speaking of very popular play elements, um, I just wanted to highlight on those kind of post and platform structures, there will be uh, climbing elements and slides. Um, and then for the two to five range, um, folding in some of those play sculptures that brought that kind of whimsical character that people were interested in in the enchanted forest. And then um, spring riders and other kind of low ground play elements for that uh, top range. And then uh, shade canopies over the, over the played structures, um, which is similar. You may have seen that um, at Coffee Park, the new playground there. And then highlighting the, what we're calling the games room, which is located um, in the center um, on this current plan. Uh, we think we can fit uh, some cornhole uh, kind of concrete planks there, um, a couple of chess tables and, and a uh, table tennis uh, slash ping pong table there. Um, and right now we've located it in the playground, but we did wanna hear uh, from everyone if that is really the best location for it. Um, there could be some of these elements, particularly the chess tables that get moved outside of the playground um, and get placed like along some of the paths. So I think this is our next uh, Zoom poll question um, around preferences for the location of these games. I think we're gonna go ahead and skip the all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have the same attendees. Thank you. Here it is. All right, so first question, where should the games be located within the park? Uh, adjacent to the playground, similar to the location that we've shown today. Um, should they be outside of the playground, um, a, you know, right off of a, a park path, for example? Um, or should we have some within the playground and some outside of the playground? Um, and then if you don't have a preference. On this question, um, in the open comment, it would be great um, if you think that some should be outside of the playground while some should be inside, um, it'd be great to know which ones um, you think are better suited outside versus inside of the playground. Um, oh, that's our second question. Look, I'm ahead of, my, ahead of myself here. So if you do think that some should be outside of the playground, uh, which ones are, are the most appropriate? Chess, uh, tennis table, cornhole, um, and then in the option of uh, that you don't think any should be outside of the playground.
been about 45 seconds since the, the last vote, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and show the results. Thank you. All right, here we are. Uh, so for the first question about where the game should be located within the park, uh, uh, no one said that, that they should be adjacent to the playground. Glad we asked. Um, and 50% said outside of the playground, um, right adjacent to a park path. Um, and 50% said some games adjacent to the playground and some games outside. All right, and then on question two, uh, which game should be outside of the playground uh, with 93% saying chess should be outside of the playground, um, 71 uh, with table tennis and 57 with cornhole. Thank you for that feedback. Um, I'd love to hear more about that uh, in the open comment. And this is our last slide here. Um, that was a, an overview, kind of highlights of all the main features of the uh, final draft master plan on the left, and then this enlargement of the of the playground uh, concept plan on the right. Uh, and we will be uh, looking at the results of the Zoom polls that we received tonight. There will be the survey will go up on the city website following this meeting. We'll receive some comments there. And then our plan will be to fold in those comments, take another pass at refining this draft master plan um, before we move on to um, the Board of Community Services. And with that, I believe we will open it to, um, to open response. Oh, sorry, I lied. Before that, we are going to uh, send you all to our community questions, uh, which are based around um, who our participants are tonight. Important questions. So let's let's hit those, please. Emily. First one is where in the city do you live? Second one is about how you heard about this meeting. The third is how often you frequent the park. And the fourth is how far do you travel to use the park? And then after this, we'll go to open comment. I'm going to give about 10 more seconds and then I will close the poll. All right, thanks everyone. Um, Let's see, we've got 85% from the Northwest Quadrant. Awesome. How we heard about this meeting, City Connection. Great job, Tim. How often you frequent the park? This one's um, pretty even split between daily, weekly, monthly, and rarely. 
And then how far do you travel to use the park? 77% within a five to 10 minute walk with a few people within a five to 10 minute drive or 10 to 20 minute drive. Right, thank you everyone for your um, participation in the Zoom poll. I think now we will open it up to uh, questions and public comments. I'd like to turn it back over to our host just to remind everybody how to participate because it's a little different with commenting. Okay, okay Jen, um, I have lowered all hands. Please raise your hand if you wish to speak. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise your hand. Host Ander will then call on those who have raised their hands. The host will unmute your microphone for your comment and then will mute you once you are finished speaking. The facilitator, host, or co-host will respond to each question or comment as it is raised. You will need to raise your hand again if a follow-up question is generated by your response that you received. don't see any hands, but I'm hopeful that someone wants to raise their hand and ask a question or give us some comments. We'd love, love, love to hear from you. Well, and while we're waiting for folks, I know we had a question in the Q&A and about what is the cost of the new sign, if there is a new sign, and there's a lot of different questions surrounding the signage, uh, the monument sign, saying the Dutch floor sign. And I just want to let everybody know that um, it's likely because we're changing the things in this park that we are going to have to update the sign somehow. There are new re uh, requirements for height of lettering and things like that that have to go into new park signage as well as lighting. So uh, we're likely to be updating the signage anyway. So that's what we're asking. Um, if, we, if we have to do it anyway, which style do you prefer? Uh, but we'll take a look and see what options we have. Uh, but the, Usually the cost of a new signage is around $25,000 for a new sign. It sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of engineering going in to make sure that sign doesn't blow down and the electrical all works, et cetera. So um, both signs cost about the same amount to place whether, which, whichever one you want to do um, for different reasons. So hopefully that helps explain some of that. Um, but as we get into the construction documents, we'll learn a little bit more about uh, what we need to do. We have a comment from Peg. Peg, I'm going to enable your speaking permissions. Um, please unmute your microphone. I will, your hand has been lowered. So go ahead and um, make your comment. Can you see the Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if the Genevieve Hirsch Memorial bench is going to remain in the park. And <clears throat> I'm also wondering about the boulders. They really look in your pictures like it's an terrible accident waiting to happen for children wanting to climb and not being the greatest climbers at that age using using the park. So uh, I'd really like to have the boulders reconsidered. I'm thinking about the insurance that's going to be needed <laughs> for accident claims. Thank you. We do have a lot of insurance. <laughs> As a city, yeah, agency. but why have it? Why why use it that way? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I can clarify that um, the existing uh, memorial benches that are in on site, uh, the labels can be reused on new park benches if we have new park benches, or if we're going to reuse some of the ones, they'll be preserved either way. And for the follow up question about the boulders, I'll turn it over to Haley. Thanks, Peg, for that um, comment. Um, we, it is something to consider, and we can look at that more closely. Um, we have seen, we've, we've done boulders in other playgrounds where there hasn't been a, an issue yet. Um, it is a, an opportunity for, for children to, to climb and, and to have a little bit more um, kind of uneven surfacing. So there's, there's benefits um, to them as well. 
but we will we will um, make sure if, if we do include them that we're, we're making sure they're surrounded by safety surfacing and, and that there are no pointy sharp edges that they're smooth boulders and things like that. Um, but in general, we will we will take that and, and, and talk about it internally. Thank you. Uh, we have two more speakers. First is Beth, followed by Dee Baring. Beth, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Um, please go ahead with your comment. Hi, uh, we, uh, first of all, thank you, and this is awesome. And it's so like pro kid, which is awesome, and community. And we live right behind the park. And we're like kind of not even in some of the questions because we're so close, we are the park. So our, our concern is what we observe in this neighborhood and the amount of garbage that we're picking up in this neighborhood, when we add more benches and trees, are we going to add an environment that's going to bring really close to our back fences a population that lives here? Homeless population. And, and I just want to talk about those realities candidly. Thank you. I think um, I'll, I'll start and then turn over to Haley if you have any design type um, follow-ups. But for when we look at our other, other parks, there are benches mm -hmm. and things we can use to uh, avoid folks sleeping or lingering. There's different types of benches that we can use rolling into that, in our, especially in our newer parks. Uh, replacing these things citywide in older parks is, is difficult, but with a new park, we have an option for, for doing that. Uh, and I'm not sure, Haley, how many more benches there are. Um, I'll turn that back to you in just a minute. But uh, And with the trees, I think a lot of the trees were um, on the street or near the street so that we're creating some shade uh, to reduce that heat, heat effect of heating up the street and heating up our environment so we're cooling down. It, not really an area where you'd want to hang out. Hang out. Um, I don't know, Haley, if you have something that's, uh, you know, a, a more understandable answer than that. <laughs> no, I think I think you hit the the main points. the The benches will likely be the number of benches will likely be similar to the number of benches that are there today. Um, we're proposing you know, benches along the paths like you see today um, in places that. Uh, you know, people will be traveling like adjacent to the paths, so that can help. Um, doing armrests on the benches, you know, sometimes a center armrest can help as well, which makes it just a bit more challenging to lay down on. Um, and then, I would guess, and maybe you could you could uh, help and inform us here on this, but I would I would guess that any kind of desirable places might be around um, the edges. Um, and I think again, just providing those clear lines of sight can help with that, um, you know, providing, not uh, providing, you know, not designing any places that are desirable to, to inhabit um, that are that are kind of dead. So I think those are the, the main strategies there um, in terms of what we can control within the park design. If, if you have any other kind of thoughts on, on that, that would be helpful or information if you see that happening there today. We have seen people trying to make up camps behind our fences, the backyard, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and especially between the school and the park. Okay. They like that space, and we're I'm worried about the fences being, you know, the fence between the school might make a nice little cozy place for them. <laughs> I see. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, we make sure that, that fence is transparent and. Um, Maybe we just keep grass through there and, and, and no shrubs to help with that visibility. Thank you, that would be great. The next commenter is Dee Baring. I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone and provide your comment. Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for um, having the meeting. Um, boy, my comment seems kind of low key compared to the last one, but. You know, it just seems that having water with the sand sounds just like, like a kind of a mess waiting to be to happen. It, you know, there's sand there now without water and it seems like, a, I don't know, a cleaner situation. And just a second comment is I'm super thrilled to see the chess and I'd be happy when it fits away from the playground because um, it just makes more sense. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other comments or thoughts you want to share? There was one additional comment. Um, Nohimi, I have um, enabled your speaking. Oh. Um, Nohimi, um, I, I am being told by Zoom that you have an older version of Zoom. Um, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to type your question into the Q&A feature. I'm so sorry about that. Um, the next question is from Mike. Mike, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please go ahead and make your comment. Yes, I, I have a question regarding the uh, the fence and the gate between the park and the school. Um, it, it wasn't clear to me whether um, whether the fact that the gate would be open before and after school meant through the evening um or just during the times when um uh, when children are coming and going um uh, i understand there is a difference between the park and the school but when i walk through the park i frequently then go ahead and walk through the school as part of a walking route i take and i would like that to remain at least during non-school hours if possible that's what i had Thanks, Mike, and, and we can definitely share that with the principal for the, for the school. Um, we know that uh, during school, they'd like to keep it closed, but that's really all the, and that, you know, we wanted to make sure that um, students would be able to get to school before and after, but we'll share the comments we have tonight with the school and pass that along as well. And as soon as we have anything, um, anything from the school district about that, we can also share that as well. I don't currently see any hands, but there is um, a question that maybe we could answer live. Um, overall, we like the designs that were shown tonight. One thing that we did not see mention of was a water fountain or water bottle refill station. Um, can you talk about that and also how the exercise equipment um, will be maintained? Yeah. So thanks for that question and uh, about the water bottle filling station and the water fountain. Um, because there is fitness equipment, equipment there, we can absolutely um, look at putting in a water bottle station um, there as a way to facilitate uh, folks utilizing that. Um, and the second part of the question was about the maintenance. So all the maintenance is being performed uh, at that level by our park, by our staff, our city staff, maintenance staff. So they'll come in and clean that and sanitize it um, usually once a week or depending on how often it's being used, they'll come in more. Uh, and usually our park uh, staff are in our parks at least once a day so they can come by and um, take care of anything that needs it. Uh, similar to Bear Park, uh, we have very similar equipment there. And now Coffee Park, we have a very similar thing at Coffee Park and it's it's uh, very well maintained. So, and a lot of the, I mean, hopefully Haley can attest to some of this too. Uh, a lot of the newer equipment is really uh, designed very well to be in a public setting versus things you might've seen in some of our older parks. The next question comes from Peg. Peg, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute and provide your comment. Thank you. Uh, I would, I'm wondering if um, there are, there are plans for signage asking dog walkers, the, the owners of dogs to um, have bags and clean up after their dogs. Uh, I find that uh, rather objectionable when I'm trying to walk through on the grass, uh, even though it's brownish, uh, it still is a softer thing to walk on than uh, the sidewalks always. And the sidewalks aren't always clean either because of the dogs. So I would appreciate 
looking into that if you haven't already, and I'm guessing you have checked on it, so thanks. We will definitely have signage about uh, dogs on leash, and we can add courtesy signs about pet pickup as well. We have an additional comment, Jen, from um, an attendee. Uh, is 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 the metal sign upgrade? If it occurs, where does the money come from? Is it come from the existing budget? Yes, the existing uh, budget we have is going to be used for everything that gets updated in the park. Uh, the only thing we wouldn't do if there was something some. Um, really unique feature or whatever that couldn't be added because of the budget then we would do that but the monument sign has to be part of the sign as part of our city code and the fire department requires a specific type of signage so again it's one of those things that the cost is pretty much the same for either sign um, so it's all coming out of the budget if that helps <laughs> Does anyone else have other questions or comments, um, things that you really liked or things you don't feel comfortable with? Um, Beth, I see your hand. Uh, I've given you permission to speak. Please unmute your microphone and give your comment. The one thing I didn't hear mentioned was about garbage and recycling, because currently there are no recycling cans out there. I didn't know if that's part of the plan or not. Yes, that's a that's a good question. We were changing. There's a new state uh, law requiring us to provide recycling and compost. So there'll be uh, traditional trash as well as recycling and compost bins. Uh, usually they come, uh, manufacturers make them so they're all very compact and in a nice tidy area. Um, another question from the Q&A, will the water feature still be on during the winter? Um, and what times of year will it be on if not in the winter? We usually turn, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to remember this from the maintenance staff. We usually turn them on on April 1st, and I think we turn them off sometime um, in October. I'm not remembering the exact dates, but we do turn uh, the water off, including drinking fountains, off in the winter. I don't see any more hands or, and there are no more open questions. Last, last call for questions, otherwise we'll move on to our next steps. Okay, things look good. Let's move along to next steps. Thank you. All right, well, we just wanted to thank everybody um, for participating and let you know that, again, if you know somebody that wasn't able to attend tonight, or if you weren't, for whatever um, technical reason, weren't able to participate, that the community survey is available at the Park Projects website. If you go to our City of Santa Rosa, srcity.org um, forward slash park dash projects. You can find it, um, Google it. I'm sure it'll pop right up. I do it all the time. Uh, that's another place where you can um, type in open-ended comments if you uh, would like to pass that along to anybody that would like to participate in that. And uh, Haley, do you have anything to add about the survey coming up? No, I just, just um, that it will be the, the same presentation that you saw here today will be up there as well. So if you wanted to look back or look closer at any of the drawings that will be up there um, for you to see. All right, and then just a reminder of where we're headed. Uh, this is our final community meeting. We'll, we'll take the comments that we heard and fold them into the final master plan. Um, and then from there, we'll 
we'll move on to getting into the details of the construction documents um, for the park. Okay, and a big thank you here um, uh, to our host working behind the scenes, uh, Tim Bernard, his regular day job is not hosting <laughs> uh, webinars, but uh, you can definitely contact him if something comes up and you would like to ask some questions and want some clarification. Uh, this is uh, certainly by no means the end of the conversation. We um, would be grateful to hear from you and you can get in touch with uh, Tim at tbernard at srcity.org. So it's T-B-E-R-N-A-R-D at srcity.org. And our phone number, 543-3969. Uh, and of course, our website, um, it has a lot of information about what not only what's happening for this next survey and where we're going with this, but also um, all of the recorded meetings we've already had to date. So if you want to get a little more update, or a little more information, that's there as well. Next slide. And just a big thank you very much. Um, we look forward to seeing you all attending at the Board of Community Services meeting, which would be the next. We'll take everything we hear from the surveys and uh, everything we've heard tonight and refine the master plan. And we'll be bringing that to the Board of Community Services, which is an advisory body of the city council. And that date will be posted on our website when that comes up, but we're targeting the um, October meeting, which- um, It's on the 27th. Yeah, 20. <laughs> thank you. But that information will be posted on our website just in case for whatever reason it needs to get, get uh, shifted. But that's the plan to go to the Board of Community Services in October for a recommendation. And after that, we'll go to uh, City Council uh, probably sometime in December or uh, early January. So thank you, everyone. And thanks very much to um, our, um, our facilitator, Haley, at Plural Landscape Architecture Studio and her staff. And of course, thanks for all the um, Board of Community Services members attending. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you um, in October, if not sooner. <laughs>